All right, Mark Dunkelman, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. Your book is The Vanishing Neighbor, and it's about the the changing ways Americans are organizing themselves socially and interacting with each other. I'm curious, what led you to the research and the writing of this book? Was it a hunch you had or a personal experience? I mean, what was it that said, I need to look into this a little bit more, what's going on? Two things happened to me almost simultaneously. Uh, the first was that I'd been working in Washington for several years, and I was sitting around with a bunch of old poobahs who were kvetching about how uh, Washington didn't work anymore. And they were going through the whole litany of reasons that we hear about all the time. Too much money in politics, uh, gerrymandering, the filibuster, too many lobbyists, it goes on and on. And I would have this experience where I was living in Washington, but my family's in Buffalo. I'd fly home, and I'd land at the airport. My father would pick me up, and we'd be driving home. And at some point in the course of the conversation, he'd turn to me and he'd say, Mark, what the hell are they doing down there in Washington? And I would try out each of the explanations that I'd heard the Pooh Boss talk about. I'd say, well, it's the filibuster. And my dad, who's a pretty smart guy, would say, well, Mark, the filibuster rules haven't changed since the 70s. So why is it they're filibustering more now? And I'd sort of be left dumb, dumbfounded. And then the next time I'd fly home to Buffalo, he'd kick me up and he'd, I'd complain again. And I, I'd give him another explanation, like, like it's gerrymandering. And say, Mark, gerrymandering is named after James Madison's vice president. So how can that be? And you go through the whole list of common explanations, and they are all, uh, uh, you go through all the old explanations, they all existed in eras where government seemed to work, or at least it seemed to work better than it does now. And so I began thinking, something else has got to be going on. Second thing happened was I began thinking more and more about the holidays that I'd spent as a kid. My family was from Cincinnati. I grew up in Buffalo. And we would go back to Cincinnati every holiday season, and we'd drive up and down the street where my father grew up, and he would look at each house, and he'd tell me the story of each family. This guy, you know, went, there was a lousy student, but then got into a good college, you know. This woman did this. This guy invented the electric toothbrush and sold it to Procter & Gamble for a zillion dollars in the 1950s, whatever it was. And I realized that back in Buffalo, I didn't have that experience at all. I was delivering the Buffalo News to the, my neighbors uh, four years into having moved, and I couldn't have told you the name of any of the people, save for the few kids that went to my elementary school. Um, and I think if I'd bumped into my next-door neighbor at the grocery store, Wakelands, I, I would not have been able to recognize them. So I began to wonder, is there some connection between what's happened in Washington and what I was experiencing in Buffalo? There's some, some, some connection, and that sort of got me off on a whole jaunt of research that ended up with this book. Okay. And I think what's interesting is that a lot of people can probably relate to that second. Well, I mean, most, I think most people are, are can agree that, you know, the government, Washington is sort of like at a standstill and there's a lot of gridlock, but also that second uh, hunch or that feeling you had that just like something like there's not a sense of community that people used to like, are we're very nostalgic for it. It doesn't exist anymore. Um, so I think a lot of people resonate with that. I know I do. But before we get to why, why we, why there was a change between you, your experience growing up and your father's growing experience growing up, I guess we gotta do a lot of groundwork here. So let's talk about this. What are, you argue there are three ways that, or three rings of social organization that humans organize themselves with. Can you explain what those three rings are? Yeah. So I, I, my argument is that if, if you imagine your whole social world on a, a diagram that looks like the rings of Saturn, where you're the planet and the people, everyone you know is organized along the ring. So the most intimate contacts, your spouse, your best friend, your children, your parents are in the it's sort of innermost ring. And then moving out are the people who are less and less intimacy to the point that you get to the, the uh, uh, barista that you spoke to for five seconds uh, when you ordered a a latte or, a, or, or whatever, uh, several days earlier, and you'll never see again. So if you think about the time and energy you have each day, you get to choose where you're going to invest your, uh, your time and energy. The sort of innermost rings, I call them the, 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 the inner rings, are the people who are really, really close to you. So this is generally 10 or 12, 15 people who you know really well. It varies from person to person and from culture to culture. But generally... Those are the people uh, that you're, you know almost
almost uh, everything about you um, or, or know the most about you. Uh, on the, and the very out, outside rings are, are people that don't know you at all, except for some, you have share some single uh, interest. So I am uh, one of about three dozen Cincinnati Bengals fans in the world. Um, <laughs> and unfortunately, I think we've lost a couple uh, since, since that loss of Pittsburgh. But, but um, I know a bunch of those people just because I look on blogs about Cincinnati Bengals um, and, and follow them. Um, but I have no real tangential connection uh, with them, or no substantive connection with them. Uh, in between those inner and outer rings are what I call the middle rings. And those are people who are uh, familiar but not intimate. They are people that you would know well enough to uh, ask them about something that's important in their lives if you bumped into them on the street. That you know, well, you're, I know here your father was sick, how's he doing? Uh, I hear, you know, your, your business is growing like gang- gangbusters. Are you, are you going to open another store? You, you know, you, you, the, it's, it's, you would know enough about them to have sort of a real conversation. These are the kind of conversations you would have from a familiarity that would grow, from a familiarity that would grow maybe at the, at the, uh, when you were talking to someone uh, over the donuts at the back of the PTA meeting or while you were waiting for your uh, chance to bowl in a bowling league or – um, uh, when you were at a, a Rotary Club meeting, whatever it was, that those are the sorts of conversations that, that sort of happen in the background, and you develop a connection. And the, the sort of the core thesis of my book is that over the last several decades, uh, we've taken the time and attention that we each control and invested it much more heavily in the, those innermost rings, our most intimate connections, and much more heavily in the outermost rings. So, you know, I, I could not. I live in Providence, Rhode Island, and it'd be very hard for me to know Cincinnati Bengals fans. Uh, 40 years ago, but now I can know a bunch of them because uh, because of all sorts of changes in technology. What's been lost in the in the in the wash are the middle ring connections. We have very few connections or fewer connections than we once did with people who are familiar but not intimate. Okay, so before we get to why that is, why we've made this transition to focusing more on the inner rings and the outer rings and less on the middle ring, let's do a little let's backtrack. Let's do some history. So you to art make the case that. This focus that I think all of us have this nostalgia for, yeah, there was a time when everything was sort of Norman Rockwell, neighbors, new neighbors, they talked to each other, people went to church and did, you know, cake walks and, uh, you know, or cake bakes and whatever, and went to PTA meetings. <clears throat> and this idea that we have, the sort of ideal of community in America, you argue got its start all the way in cl- when the colonies first w- organized themselves. So how did colonial Americans organize themselves, how did that differ from their European contemporaries? This sort of, it, it, it's sort of a fascinating, it's a fascinating story. The, the, um, when, when people came to the new world, the old social hierarchies that had existed in Europe for the most part c- couldn't exist in quite the same way. There just weren't enough people. So you lived in a town, you got to know people across really what I call the middle rings. You, whether you were of a certain certain uh, standing, if you had a certain religious background, if you had a certain uh, uh, point of view, like it's, it's not to say that, that it was entirely diverse, but there was a, a standard of, uh, of community organization that Tocqueville talked about in the 1830s that differed from what existed in, the, in, the, in, the, in Europe in the sense that if you had a problem in the community, in your town, in your village in New England, in the 1700s, everyone got together and tried to figure out a solution. Um, you could have hated the guy down on the corner, you could have disliked the family, you could have disagreed on everything, but on some level you had to develop some sort of mutual understanding because you needed one another to survive. That didn't exist in the much more bifurcated European society where people were much more split along uh, class lines, uh, hierarchies, royalty, the whole bit. And so there was sort of a, a sort of a core way of, of organizing your community that made it look much more like Little House on the Prairie versus in Europe, they had sort of a... a, a uh, in, in Europe, they organized themselves much more like Downton Abbey, where you had a sort of a central manor, a powerful family, and then uh, a class of the people below it. There was a much more egalitarian orientation in the United States or, or in the colonies at that point. Um, and what's fascinating is that that sort of core building block of American uh, community existed in, 
in colonial villages and frontier towns. It existed even in uh, in, in urban suburbs at the turn of the 20th century, and, in, and then in the in the beginnings of, of suburbs. Um, and I think that it's only now, for the first time, that that core building block, what I call township community, is beginning to fly apart. Okay, and, and this this township community. I mean, how did this township model of community organize organizing ourselves socially? How did that affect like American political organization, not only in government but also sort of civic organizations and um, uh, non profit? I guess what you'd call non profit organizations. I guess what are you would you call them? Mutual beneficial societies, whatever. Um, the kind of how to how to answer that. Um, every institution is built on a certain foundation. There's like a house is built on a foundation, an institution is built on a foundation. And you would build your house to, uh, to the specifications detailed by the foundation. If you had a, uh, a foundation that was cracked, you'd need to find some way to either fix the foundation or build a house in a different way. The foundation for American institutions of all sorts, the way we governed ourselves, the way we took care of ourselves medically or through health care, the way we educated ourselves, the foundation in each case was this building block of township community where people who didn't know one another intimately well but knew each other to a degree of familiarity that they could understand where the other was coming from came together and discussed their ideas and uh, negotiated and um, uh, traded back and forth what they wanted, what the other people wanted, tried to accommodate uh, one another in a way that, that, that didn't exist in other societies. And so the, the sort of the, the unwritten part of the American Constitution is that we expect that the voters will uh, have some experience with the people on the other side. So even if they feel strongly about one party or another, or if they feel strongly about one position or another, the presumption is that in the course of thinking about who they're going to vote for, that they will have some appreciation for the other point of view that they'll have some uh, sense that maybe they don't agree with what Sarah Palin says, or maybe they don't agree with what Bernie Sanders says, or whoever it is, that they will at least have some appreciation for why they, w- why someone else would feel strongly passionate about supporting that candidate. Um, and so we build, a, the, the, the whole system of American government presumes that voters will have that sort of tendency to accommodate various points of view in mind when they are selecting people at the ballot box. And that, 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 that's sort of one example, but that exists across the span uh, of American institutions. Gotcha. So why has the, this township model of uh, community organization, why has that been in decline in America for the the past, you know, c- several decades. Because, I mean, it's interesting. You, you talk about in the book how, you know, it, it founded in sort of this frontier idea of America, uh, with the colonists, where they had to rely on each other. But it even survived uh, the Industrial Revolution. But something changed in the past 40, you know, 50 years that, that, that it's no longer surviving, like it's being replaced by another form of uh, social organization. So why the decline? Yeah. I like to think of this as a classic sort of whodunit. So you've got you got to figure out the motive and the opportunity. The opportunity is probably pretty clear to most people who listen to this podcast. We've got many more opportunities to uh, interact with people of our choice than we did, uh, or than our grandparents did. Right? You can now, as I said, I'm a Cincinnati Bengals fan, and I can be in touch with other Cincinnati Bengals fans. Alternatively, on sort of in the inner rings, when I travel for work now, probably. Three generations ago, I would have been really bored. There would have been three channels to watch on the television, and and I, I couldn't have been in touch with my wife or children, so I would have uh, gone down to the hotel bar and had a conversation with somebody I didn't know. Now, when I get to my hotel and it's uh, it's seven o'clock, I can order room service, watch any movie I want, uh, re- read you know Good Night Moon to my children over over FaceTime, um, and there's no reason re- reason for me to to go da- to go downstairs. So so like. It, it, there you're seeing how opportunity, our opportunities to invest our time in the outer and the inner rings have grown dramatically. Um, no matter what your particular interest is, maybe you're really into knitting, 
or maybe mm-hmm. you're into a different football team, or maybe you're very interested in, in bike lanes. Um, whatever it is, you can find your people in the outer rings and also spend more time with the people who you're uh, closest to. The, the question then is, are we motivated to take those opportunities? Are you more motivated? Are you more interested when you get to your hotel room while traveling to uh, check your blog, to FaceTime with your family, uh, watch watch a movie by yourself, or you're more mo- mo- motivated to go downstairs uh, and meet people you don't know? I had a long conversation. I don't know if you'll remember 20 years ago when people had Palm Pilots. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had my, one. <laughs> my, I, there was a there was an app on the Palm Pilot called Vindigo, and Vindigo was this really cool app at the time where you could type in the intersection where you were in most major cities and ask for a certain cuisine. So if you wanted a bowl of pasta, you'd put in Italian and Vindigo would tell you where the closest Italian restaurant was. I thought this was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. My grandfather, who has since passed away, I showed it to him. He went white as a ghost. And I didn't know why. I said, what's what's the problem? And he said, Mark, let me tell you, when I was a traveling salesman, I lived in Cincinnati and I would take a train down to North Carolina uh, to, to... to, to talk with him. He was uh, in the hosiery business. Uh, and he'd get out of the train station, and uh, if he was hungry, he'd go and say to somebody at the train station or somebody that looked like they knew what, what they were doing, hey, I've got a question for you. I'm new to town. Is there a place where I can grab a bowl of pasta or is there, is there a good steak restaurant or whatever it was? And the person, they'd have a conversation. And then maybe they would go to dinner together. Or maybe he would go to the restaurant and he'd develop a conversation with the people who, who were there. But that was the norm. He desired the opportunity to, to talk to people like that. And my grandfather's reaction when he saw the <coughs> my grandfather's desire when he saw Vindigo, my my grandfather's fear when he saw Vindigo was that those sorts of conversations, which he thought had sort of added such value to his life, expanded his experience, under, sort of uh, uh, widened his understanding of how the world worked, would be lost because we would no longer have those sorts of random interactions. And that's sort of an indication of how the technology and, and, and desire have changed, but it's, um, uh, it's sort of a, a broader phenomenon as well. One thing I, I've noticed is that, the, the and there's some scholarship on this as well, the very word neighborly has changed in America over the past, course of the past several decades. It used to be that being neighborly meant that when someone moved in next door, you brought over a plate of cookies, or you, uh, uh, you, if you needed milk uh, in a pinch, you could you could walk next door and 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 grab a gallon. Today, the word neighborly has been turned on its head. Today, neighborly means that if you're living in an apartment building and you hear a couple have an argument through the wall, when you see them in the lobby the next morning, you don't say anything. Neighborly has come to mean something that is much more about. Uh, uh, boundaries between people than it is bringing people together. And so the, the, the confluence of those two elements, the fact that we have, have more opportunities to make different sorts of, of, of uh, connections with people, and the fact that we, are, we don't desire, like we, we are more, we're more tethered to our privacy than to our sense of connection to the people who live next door. But those two things have compelled people to invest their time and attention in different sorts of relationships. Gotcha. So, okay, I'll just recap. So it seems like it's technology had a lot of effect, right? Because we can communicate with or associate with who we want to associate, not necessarily are not confined by geography. And the technology, in a way, changed our motivations to like, okay, I'm just going to focus on that. Is that my understanding you correctly? Yeah, I, I don't know whether whether I'm sure that the technology has necessarily been the sole factor in changing what we desire. I think that that, that there are a whole series of factors that, that, that plays some role in explaining who you want to spend time with. Um, uh, there's evidence now that narcissism is up in American culture. That's a few decades old. Um, uh, but I think that at, at root, you have to ask yourself, what is it that I want to get out of my social interactions? And the truth is that middle ring re- interactions with people who are familiar but not intimate are the most difficult to maintain. Because inner ring React relationships with be, with your family, with your best friends. Those are people that love you implicitly. You can say something crazy, uh, you can say something they disagree with, and they're going to love you no matter what. Or at least that's what you hope. The outer rings. Those are relationships that if someone says something that you disagree with, you just 
you just abandon the relationship, right? If if I'm talking to somebody about the Cincinnati Bengals on a blog, and it turns out that they're a Pittsburgh Steelers fan, I just abandon the relationship. Like I, I don't really want to talk to them anymore, and it's very easy to do. Same is true if you're uh, on a whole range of of outer ring relationship. It's sort of the nature of it is you 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 you've connected over a single common interest, and if you don't share the common interest, you don't maintain the relationship. In the middle rings, it's a very different situation. The middle rings are people that you're going to see the next week at the PTA meeting or at the bowling league or at the little league game, or wherever you see them, you're going to see them on the street. You can't afford in the moment when they say that they support a candidate that you think is crazy or they announce that they've got religious beliefs that you think are, uh, are, are, are totally out of line or, um, or, or they, uh, they disparage your favorite football team, whatever it is, you need to maintain that relationship. Like that's the moment where you can't lash out, you can't argue back, or if you do, you need to do it in a in a collegial way that maintains relationships, so that you don't both come away mad and abandon it. Abandon it. For some reason today, we've got limited time and attention. We don't necessarily want to spend our time and attention on people who don't share our common. Uh, we, we don't want to spend our time and attention talking to people with whom we need to sort of. Uh, we don't want to spend our time and attention talking to people who don't share a certain core set of beliefs. We'd, re- we'd rather spend it with people that love us implicitly or with people that already agree with us. So there's, that, that's a sort of a, a fundamental change in motivation that would spur us to abandon middle ring relationships in lieu of uh, having tighter inner and outer ring relationships. So you bring up a great point because I think, uh, I mean, like I know I do this. I, I, I definitely am nostalgic for the days of, you know, tight knit communities, uh, sort of Norman Rockwell esque pictures of community. But then you forget that it is exhausting, right? There's all these benefits of having a township idea of community, but like you forget that it's really exhausting. And if you look at, I mean, you can even read diaries and, uh, you know, letters from like, even like Marcus Aurelius kind of complained about people. They're just like, oh, they're just so annoying and it's a lot of hard work, but I have to like put up with them because that's part of my social duty as, as, as a human being is to interact with people that I don't necessarily agree with. So I guess one of the downsides of a township, it, it, it does it does require a lot of uh, energy and like mental bandwidth to manage. Absolutely true. More than that, you know, it sort of cuts against the Norman Rockwell view of America. The truth is that the institute that, that, that we think of middle ring institutions, rotary clubs and church choirs and little leagues and uh, PTA associations, uh, all of those are truly middle ring institutions and there's value in them. But gangs are also middle ring institutions. (laughs) The Klan was a middle ring institution, right? Those are people that knew each other fairly well. So it's not that that they are uh, uniformly for the good of America. Uh, There are advantages and disadvantages to the institutions of all sorts. So what is replacing the township? So if we had township for the first 200 odd years of of our country, what is replacing it? Well, the, the the I think networks. I mean, sort of in a word, networks are replacing townships. And what I mean by that is that now, if you're a an ophthalmologist uh, in in Oklahoma, uh, it used to be that your community was still the people who lived around you. But if you've got if you're an ophthalmologist and you want to be now be in touch with ophthalmologists all around the world, you can. Right, there's going to be a breakthrough. They did some research in Brazil. Uh, they did. Uh, there's a there's a horrible case that is really instructive that's happening in South Carolina. You can be in touch with people who are talking about that all the time, and you can develop a real sense of it's it's not the sort of intimacy that you might have had otherwise, but it, but you can develop uh, a sense of community that is at arm's length with those people who are sharing your interests, uh, share your concerns. Um, the, the the example that I use in my book, which I think is a pretty powerful one, or, is World of Warcraft, right? The, the, these these uh, 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 games that are online that allow people, one who lives in Hong Kong, one who lives in California, one uh, who lives in Europe, to coordinate the moment that they're going to storm a castle. And those are, those are, by some stretch, real relationships, right? They're coordinating their strategy, they're coordinating their timing, they're all... Uh, wrapped up in the same uh, the same adventure. The question is, 
do are those relationships that come to the depth of if one of those players their their wife gets sick or their kids in trouble or they're very sad about something or they're extremely excited about a promotion at work is that necessarily something that they're going to uh, that they're going to that they're going to interact with those folks about or is it really just about World of Warcraft is that relationship uh, really centered around one w- one single uh, shared interest. Um, so, I, I mean, obviously, in both of those examples, you see real advantages. People are really into the world of Warcraft. People are really interested in, the, in their professions. They can dive much more deeply into those interests with people who share uh, share those interests. But the downside is that the auxiliary benefits of having local or or middle ring oriented relationships, um, uh, th- th- there's something lost as well. Gotcha. And it seems like it, it fractures the individual in a way, right? Cause you like, you had to put on your world of Warcraft face on and then like, that's it. Like then you go off into like, you have like another aspect of your life that you focus on. Like people, when you interact with people in these different little nodes in your network, people aren't really concerned about your other aspects of your identity. It would seem, or maybe that's I'm exactly right. Okay. I, I, I'd sort of tell a hypothetical example uh, in in my book about uh, a, a bigoted guy who lives in Kentucky who who uh, who wants to sell a vintage baseball card. Forty years ago, he has to go to a baseball card convention and actually have a face to face interaction with someone, or he has to go to a local store or whatever it is. And and you know when he's wearing uh, uh, his his you know his his white power T shirt or whatever it is, people know what he's about and that's going to affect who he sells to. Today, that same guy could anonymously sell his card to someone who's also anonymous, who happens to be a woman who owns a small business, who's African-American in Oakland, California. And the two of them today are now doing commerce together, right? There used to be that they were separated from one another because they would never, never interact. They were never in the same circles. And so they were, they were sort of an economic div- division between the two of them because of their uh, various uh, identities. Today, those people are now interacting, but not in a substantive way, right? There's going to be no exchange of ideas. It's not, there, it's not that he's going to glean any sense of wisdom uh, from her about where she came from or, or, or what she's about. Same, I don't know if she'd want to glean anything from him, but, 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 but there'd be no flow of information the other way. There's something valuable in having people who have different points of view, even if they disagree, actual, actually having interactions. Um, that's how good ideas come from. They, they come from the fact that people who have uh, different bits of expertise take an idea from one sphere of the world and apply it to another. That's actually, frankly, that's what, where, how Gutenberg came up with the, with the printing press. It wasn't that it was a stroke of a genius. It was that he sort of lived at this nexus where he knew people who uh, had figured out how printing presses, uh, how, how presses worked, how movable type worked, how ink worked, how paper worked, and he put it all together in sort of an interesting way and developed this incredible technology of the printing press. That sort of interaction happens every day. How are you going to figure out how to get your kids between uh, all these different activities? Well, have you had a conversation with other parents who are doing the same thing or people, people who have uh, different ideas about how you're going to manage your sales force? Uh, this is how we did it. This is how, you know, good ideas come when people who have different points of view come together and share ideas. And if you're only interacting with them on over the plane of World of Warcraft or only interacting with them um, uh, because you're selling something to them on eBay, you're losing the value in those interactions. Well, and going back to the, the baseball card uh, aficionados, you know, one's black woman, another one's sort of a, you know, a white power, white supremacist type guy. And you make kind of, you make the subtle case in your book, a point that uh, maybe this is one of the issues with why we're having a problem with race in America today. Because on the one hand, like, we're, it's not like the overt racism that was existed, um, like in the, the you know in the early part of the 20th century and the 19th century, but because of these sort of this community or network community that we have now, we can sort of take out some of the friction because you can associate with people who are who are like you, and you can interact with with people who are not like you on a very superficial level. But when you reduce that friction, you reduce the opportunity to actually talking about the substance of an issue on a, a very uh, in depth way to actually solve the problem. I mean, I think I, I, th- I think you've you've hit it exactly that that there is uh, we've made enormous progress, particularly on the the legal uh, the legal barriers that separated communities of different races. The question now is, and this sort of gets back to the sort of issue of 
of a motive and opportunity. We now have the opportunity to interact with people who have different points of view and come from different communities. The question is, are we actually choosing uh, to take advantage? Are we motivated to spend our time and attention with people who are different from us? And in too many cases, it seems to me, there's, there's too much at risk, right? That you're going to say something wrong, that you're going to offend somebody else, that you're going to somehow come off um, uh, having exposed some uh, inner prejudice um, to the point that that risk that, 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 that you're going to say something wrong in many cases makes it so that you don't actually reach out. What a shame that is, right? What a shame it is that the people who have different points of view are not actually having an interaction so that we're learning from one another um, and that we prefer in too many cases uh, to spend time uh, with people who share our point of view. Um, and that's, I mean, that, that's not just about race. That's on all, all sorts of issues. That's, you know, people who support Donald Trump and people who don't support Donald Trump or people who, uh, who think we need uh, single-payer health care and people who don't. Are they actually having interactions so that they have some depth of mutual understanding? You know, one's a liberal college professor who, uh, who really believes that there, we need to break down all sorts of social barriers. One's a, an independent businesswoman who runs a coffee shop and is completely bogged down by all the regulations that come from the local government. She gets four pieces of mail from the Department of Business Regulation every every day and can't figure out what any of them mean and has to have, have to hire a lawyer and, uh, and might put her out of business. If the two of them have a conversation, a substantive conversation about what the other's point of view is, it may be, it may not be that they end up voting for the same candidate, but at least when their candidate wins, and goes to Washington or goes to the state house or goes to city hall and starts reaching out to the other, other side, they're not going to think that they've abandoned the, you know, the, the voters that sent them, right? They're not going to say, oh, well, you, 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 you've, uh, you're reaching out to somebody else. You clearly have no principles. No, they've got principles, but they are trying to accommodate somebody else's concerns as well. Um, if you're not able to do that in your own life, it's much harder, or you're not taking the opportunity to do that in your own life. If you're not taking the opportunity to do that in your own life, it's much harder for you to stomach the idea that your guy or your uh, uh, congresswoman would go to Washington and actually do it themselves. Um, and so that, that is sort of right at the core. That's not about filibustering or gerrymandering or money in politics. That's just about what it is that the average American wants their member of Congress to do. Gotcha. So this goes back to this goes back to your original hunch, right? About uh, why you started researching this book. It's basically there's a mitch, mismatch um, between the way Americans are starting to organize themselves socially and sort of these networks and these institutions that we have that were founded when we were based in sort of a township model. That's the problem, or one of the problems. Yeah. No. I think I, I think that is the core of the problem. And and so when my father. I would get in the car with me, and I would explain that the uh, the, the filibuster in the Senate was the reason uh, that Washington was broken, was because these crazy senators were uh, stopping up pieces of legislation. And he said, well, the rules haven't changed. Why are they filibustering more often? The reason is because on some level, it's smart politically to filibuster, right? It's You want to be seen as a purist, as, not, as a principal politician. You want to be viewed as carrying a banner and uh, you're unwilling to back down. We have this sort of sense that if people would just stick to their stick to their guns more frequently, we would get more more out of Washington. Well, in fact, the whole premise of American democracy is that you're going to have factions who have different interests and different ideas and different uh, points of view. And the magic of American democracy was that Washington was a place uh, that would uh, would try to accommodate as much of that as possible, and that there would be that, that you would get more from the sum of the parts. Uh, than you would have if um, uh, if, if everyone uh, just went their own way, and that the the premise in each of those cases was that the members of Congress or the politicians writ large in the United States would um, uh, would reflect the community's view that there are a whole variety of points of view, and we need to accommodate it. We need to sort of harness the magic of that diversity, and if. Uh, and so the, the, the problem today, more than the sort of traditional litany of, of explanations, money and politics and filibustering and gerrymandering, the real change is that people in their own experience aren't reaching across the proverbial aisle. They aren't having interactions across the middle rings. 
And in the absence of those interactions, they're not willing to support politicians, support leaders who are interested in trying to meld the diversity of opinion. Right. And going back to, I mean, this is even on a personal level for the politician too. So going back to that opportunity motivation, I mean, you talk about how in the book it used to be because there were, it was so hard to get to Washington, right? You had to take trains or carriages or whatever to actually do the voting and do your work. You like live there, right? Like politicians would move to Washington, D.C., um, and because of that, they got to interact with other politicians. They'd go to dinner with each other. The families would get together. But now, uh, going back to now, people are motivated to focus on those inner rings. They're more likely to not live in Washington. They might sleep in their office and then take a plane back to their home, hometown to be with their family during on the weekends. So there's not that, that mixture that once existed before. It's cer- that, that's certainly true. That's certainly true. Okay. So, I mean, what's the solution then, right? Uh, so this is the, the trend we're going to. We're going towards uh, networked communities. And I'm sure you talk about in the book, this isn't like a, a complete transition. Like there are still townships that exist in America, pockets of it and where you see it. But we're, there's a, the trend is toward this network community. Um, do we try to push back against that? So like, you know, in the past I guess 20 odd years have been a lot of books written about that. Um, Robert Putnam's book comes to mind about we need to do a lot to bring back these middle rings that we're all bowling alone, et cetera. And we should do things to uh, encourage these middle ring communities, or should we try to adapt our institutions and organizations to this new reality? I don't, I don't have a clear answer to that question. I think it's a terrific question. And, it, and frankly, I think people, re- readers, uh, well, let me say this. I think that people who have listened to interviews with me have gotten frustrated that I don't sort of have a right. a single uh, uh, um, silver bullet answer to what we ought to do. Um, I will uh, say this. I think on the opportunity front, there's nothing much to do, right? Our opportunities have expanded. People have more choices about how to invest the limited fund of time and attention that they each control. Um we're not going to make it so that people can't play World of Warcraft. We're not going to make it so that ophthalmologists can't interact with one another across the world. We're not going to make it uh, so that uh, I can't uh, FaceTime Goodnight Moon to my daughter when I've traveled across the country. In each of those cases, we prize those opportunities, and uh, we are, uh, uh, we're, we're not going to give them up. The thing that we can begin to look at is what motivates us not to join the PTA. It's not that we shouldn't spend time with our children. It's not that we shouldn't find time for people uh, who share our particular interests. But what would motivate us not to be afraid to spend more of our time and attention in the middle rings? What would make it so that we're more inclined uh, to invest our time and attention in, uh, in middle ring interactions? My experience is that the sort of single determining factor that is uh, most powerful in helping us to decide is what sort of a series of education uh, uh, researchers have called grit, which is the ability to to thwart an impulse. So if you're in in a conversation with somebody that you know fairly well, a middle ring connection, and they say something that you think is really crazy, uh, they support a candidate that you think is is nuts, or they, they, they are supportive, or they're on, on one side or the other of a gun control debate or whatever, you've got sort of a, a few uh, options about how to react, right? You could, you could say you're an idiot uh, and walk away. You could just end the conversation right there. You could offend them. You could, uh, you could, you, you, or, or, or you could just sort of abandon the relationship altogether. The question is, are you able to develop some sort of reply where you say, you know, I'm not sure I totally agree with you on that. Here's, this is what I think. So that you're actually continuing the relationship. Are you able to with, with, with stand the impulse uh, to lash out or to, or to, to, to walk away? It, to my mind, that, that sort of single uh, determining factor, that, 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 sort of, that sort of issue is it's sort of entirely personalized. Do you have the grit to handle a disagreement? That's something that has diminished uh, in many cases in American community today or in, uh, within American individuals, that because you, you, you are uh, less inclined, because, because you, you're angered by what the other person had to say, or you're, you, you, you'd rather spend time with people you, who love you implicitly, who, who agree with you, uh, you, you decide you're not going to stick it out. 
I think that the most powerful thing we could do to reconstitute middle ring relationships is to teach future generations grit. Um, and we're right, actually, with the sort of, if, if, you, if you read the educational journals, we're sort of right on the cusp of being, being able to develop a curriculum that encourages people to develop grit at a young age. There's this fairly well-known, in, sort of, in certain, certain circles, a fair-known test called the marshmallow test, where you put a four-year-old in front of a marshmallow and you say to him or her, you can eat this marshmallow at any point, I'm going to walk away, I need to run an errand, when I get back, if the marshmallow is still here, I'll give you a second marshmallow and you can eat both of them. And what they found is, this started in the 60s, they found that 20 years later, the kids who were able to withstand the impulse to eat that first marshmallow and waited for the second marshmallow were light years ahead in all sorts of facets of life. They were less likely to be incarcerated, less likely to be uh, addicted to uh, some sort of substance. They earned more money. They were more likely to have gotten a, a college degree. They, the, across the span of life, you do better if you've got uh, the, the grit to control your impulses. And I think that, that, that we rarely connect that idea of impulse control to community. But the truth is that's sort of, that is the core uh, competency when it comes to building a middle room relationship. The core competency is being able to deal with a disagreement in an agreeable way, to maintain a relationship even when there's some ideological uh, disagreement. Um, and if we were able to build the next generation of Americans to have additional grit, to have that impulse control, they'll be much more likely to invest their time and attention in those sorts of relationships that have been lost. That's awesome. And, and even for our listeners who are, you know, not children, you have, you know, if you have parent, if you have, if you're a parent, you can start doing that. But like, you know, this is the art of manliness podcast. This sounds like, you know, developing middle ring relationship is like, you know, throwing your hat in the arena, like Teddy Roosevelt style, like seen as a challenge and not, not shying away from it. I, I mean, I, I think you couldn't, you couldn't put it any better way. I love it. Well, Mark Dunkelman, where can people learn more about the book and your work? Um, well, I've written a, a bunch. Uh, the, 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 the book is uh, The Vanishing Neighbor, The Transformation of American Community. It's sold wherever quality books are, uh, are, are on offer. Um, and uh, uh, Google my name. You'll find all sorts of interesting stuff, I hope. Awesome. Well, Mark Duckelman, thanks so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Take care. My guest today was Mark Dunkelman. He's the author of the book, The Vanishing Neighbor, The Transformation of American Community. You can find that on Amazon.com and bookstores everywhere.